people standing up for a principle, for a, literally a place, um, for the for the notion of freedom of assembly. At the beginning of the process, people were saying, well, what good is freedom of assembly without a, a place to assemble, for God's sake? Um, looking around the city at the, at the beginning of the process, they said to themselves, what in the world is happening here? Uh, a, a city, 150 years old, and not one single public square? When all of us came from places, like place fabric, village fabric, every single race, all across the geography of the planet. A sense of place that was replete in the villages where we grew and where we built culture, where we learned how to speak and sing and count and share stories. And it was in these intersections where we built culture and we developed a sense of self. So, really, assembly, place, intersections, culture, they come together, they're mutually interdependent. And at the beginning of Pioneer Square, of course, it really wasn't so much a beginning because there were stories and stories going on here. But the indigenous people subsumed by violent processes that were so corrupt and unjust, unfair and violent. You know, after a while, things rose here and things were torn down in a process that really is the, what paved the way for capitalism, in which time and space and life was viewed as a commodity. Perhaps there was a school here, and then it was torn down, another thing was built, and then it was torn down, and then the Portland Hotel was built. And it was torn down to make a two-story parking garage here. Myron Frank tore, tore down an enormous, wonderful, lavish, and beautiful um, thing that could have been a legacy for our whole city. And it was a gathering place, but it was reduced to rubble, and then this parking garage was built. And around the beginning of the 70s, there was a plan advanced to build an 11-story parking garage. And they knew at the same time that there was a movement to create a public square here. There was, there was talk all across the city about taking some block and turning it into a public living room at last, after 150 years. One place where time and space and life would not be for sale. Myron Frank had different ideas. Frank Ivancy had different ideas. A couple of other members of the city council had different ideas. Ivancy is actually on record as having said, we can't build that. That would facilitate a revolution. <laughs> well, that was an invitation. In fact, people within the city government itself and within the neighborhoods and also in businesses all across the city joined forces to join their forces to take this vision forward and stop that 11-story parking garage and create this place of assembly. Supposedly, it's one of the five most successful and most beautiful public places in all the world. Um, I don't need to think of it that way. I just think of it as our place at the heart of our city. It's a very successful, very successful place that uh, works to bring us together in formal and informal ways for celebrations and incidental gatherings. You know, the notion of democracy it's not really so much about voting. It's about making decisions. It's about saying hello. It's about falling in love. Yeah, we make decisions, but then after that, do we get to inhabit the fruit of our labor? After making these choices together, do we become improved people where we actually know how to speak and we know how to listen to each other? Well, supposedly, out of, out of true democracy, families flourish and people become richer in a cultural sense. That's why this place was created. But there was something of a war that had to happen in order for it to be created, and how unfortunate. You know, why would we ever have to fight against any interests, any of the large businesses downtown? Why did we have to fight them? Why did we have to fight our supposed leader, Frank Ivancy, our mayor, in order to create, at last, a place for children and families to come together together and see each other? A place where time and space and life would not be for sale. One place where we would not have to experience this sort of barrage of commodification upon our senses. So that's what this place is about, and that's why people fought so hard to create it. And as it becomes further and further controlled and restricted, we have to stand up against that and retain it for the future, because even this can become defunct if it becomes too dysfunctional and too authoritarian in the way that it's administrated in the way that it's run. I just want to think for a second about war. I mean, 
We're talking about the Iraq war lately, but that's only the latest chapter in an ongoing kind of war. I mean, as we're, as we're enacting this war across the ocean and draining our, our, our communities of resources that go to kill and destroy other communities, you know, at the same time we're noticing that there's strife in the streets and our children are troubled and they're seeking, seeking to escape from their communities and families are being fragmented. And as we redirect our resources to other places, we know that we are bearing the cost. We are bearing it right at home. We can see it in our children's eyes. We can see it in the way that the planet's climate is changing. Our attentions are redirected elsewhere while our na national coffers are pilfered. And also, while we perpetually don't seem to be in control of our own destinies at a local level. Well, I'm very proud to live in Portland, Oregon, and I don't pretend that it's a perfect place. But it certainly is, to set, is developing a stronger sense of place. I'm proud of the fact that we stand up and we say, we want more bike lanes. We want more bike lane miles per capita. Now we have more commuters per capita, more bike commuters per capita, and more bike lane Lane, lane miles per capita than any other city in the nation, and we have nowhere near enough, just like those other cities do. We have the strongest citizen involvement infrastructure in the city, and yet it's comparatively weak compared to what it needs to become. There are so many different ways in which this city is the leading, the leading city in the nation, and yet it is so insignificant still compared to what it needs to. In, in, in terms of what it needs to become in order for us to really direct our own destiny. But I'm so proud of us all for fighting the good fight, or rather dancing the good dance, or however you, however you want to creatively think of it. We should be enjoying ourselves along the way as we're struggling at the same time, and engaging, you know, really every, 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 every point of conflict um, that is necessary in order to win the day. I'm so happy to be able to be here and, and to talk about this. War isn't something that I normally talk about. Normally I'm getting to be creative with other Portlanders. But I do care. Everybody in the city does care, even if we're in denial and even if we're trying to hide. We feel strongly about it. So I'm really proud of us all for being here today and proud of you all in particular who come here every week to stand up on our behalf. And I think it makes an enormous difference. If people weren't standing up across the nation on street corners like this, how much worse would it possibly be if there wasn't any sense of resistance, as if we were all complicit in, complicit in the situation and the politicians were entirely unfettered? What would be happening in, on this planet? So even if it seems as if we haven't quite changed the world yet and war has not been extinguished, it has made an enormous difference. And as we continue to apply more and more pressure and create alternative infrastructures that demonstrate a better way of living, eventually it will happen that war will be extinguished. But if that's going to happen at the same time, we have to see not war merely in conventional terms, because there is a perpetual war. There's a perpetual war against families, against children against the lower class, so-called lower classes by the upper classes. An, er an erosion of our quality of life, a betrayal of inherent social contracts of what it means to be human. And so we need to not give up. In fact, we won't give up and we can't give up because we're hardwired to love each other and to connect. So anyway, that's all I have to say today. I'm really glad to be here. And I really appreciate you all. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.